Hi, this is Mike Ross, public address announcer for your Toronto Maple Leafs, and this is the Leafs Late Night Podcast, your post-game destination. And now, your starting lineup, Roscoe, the Fanalist, Southey, Beaner, and Darty Brodeur on the Leafs Late Night Podcast. Could you imagine a 11 game winning streak? Just think about that for a second, Steph. Being on an 11 game winning streak, what that would feel like. Because it's something that Leafs Nation has never experienced ever in the 100 plus years. Not to be a negative melee, because I know we got a point here in overtime, but um, this isn't even the first time the Devils have gone on a 10 game winning streak. And uh, I don't know, it's just annoying. Uh, yeah, it hurts in overtime. You want that second point. But hey, now the Devils are uh, second uh, in their franchise history with the longest streak at 12 consecutive wins. <laughs> Who saw that no, coming, they're at, honestly? They're at 11. 11. Or 11. They're looking for the 11. Sorry. Yes, you're right. Um, but hey, their stats coming into tonight was kind of like uh, Boston, Carolina, Vegas, where they're no stranger to the Leafs being good on the dot, you know, high up with goals against average, you know, lots of shots on the net. So tonight we knew it was going to be a challenge, not only because of their winning streak, but it's because it's a young Devils team. Yeah, and I mean, everybody had them pegged for bottom of the Metro or, you know, maybe just above Philly. But holy, I mean, every every young player takes a step forward every year. But I think everyone doubted all of the young players all taking a step forward and a huge step forward at the same time on the Devils. Because like we were talking about, they don't really have a ton of veteran presence there. I mean, there's what, Palat, who's been injured, he hasn't played there yet. And um, Tatar is yep. there? Tatar is there. Uh, you're right, Palat's injured. He's only played six games, but he has uh, six, or sorry, three goals to count on that. And, you know, the Devils kind of remind me of our Leafs in their first couple of years, like our core before yeah. the JT times, right? Like when Austin Matthews, Marner, Willie Nylander were young guys and Dubis was trying to, and the GM beforehand, you know, putting in veterans, kind of plugging the holes here and there, or like palm of the barrel guys and just saying, Go ahead, guys. Go have fun. <laughs> like we knew well, the talent's there, and they just—it's coming. But now it's working for the Devils. But the difference that I mean with the Devils here is they don't really—they don't have other, their Patrick Marlowe or Joe Thornton like the Leafs tried to fit in there, or the Jason Spezza. They don't have that you know old superstar that's kind of teaching all these kids. They've got what Damon Severson and Dougie Hamilton, who are older guys on the team at twenty-eight and twenty-nine or whatever they are, <laughs> and then. Uh, Tatar, who's probably one of the oldest guys on the team. Like, there's nobody there that's really showing these guys the way. So I think that's why it's surprising that so many of them have gotten so good since last uh, last year when they were just abysmal to watch. And also the fact that – can we just – again, I don't want to steal something from the, the Dangle show, but can we talk about how bad Washington is at uh, assessing their goalies? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, the Devils had their superstar veteran in the back end last year in P.K. Subban, but hey, congrats on him getting his ESPN deal and moving on. But um, the Devils so far this year have five goalies on the roster, and uh, last year they went through seven. So, you know, nothing's really slowing them down, no matter if there's injury in the lineup. I mean, they're getting the job done at the end of the day, and... Clearly, it was well-deserved because tonight, uh, it wasn't easy for the Leafs. Uh, They were toe-to-toe the entire time. This Devils team is so fast. Holy. But one thing that uh, was pointed out, um, they kind of got to 2-1, and they went, all right, we're going to be the 2002 Devils now and just (laughs) protect the net. And for a team that was, like, flying around, as soon as it was 1-0, it was like, all right, we're going to come back. We're going to get a couple goals. One goal lead is enough. And defense, everybody. Oh, Ugh. it was so boring for a while. Like, it was really high octane. Sorry, I have something in my eye, and we're on video this time, of course. <laughs> it's okay. Um, 
the uh, the devils were just flying. Um, I lost my point because I was scratching my eye, but um, just when I'm looking at it, face-offs, because you mentioned it earlier, I wanted to touch on this. At one point, it was 75-25 for the Leafs. I'm surprised to see it ended 60-40. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the end of the first period, it was 80-20 for the Leafs, <laughs> actually. Yeah, Gross. I know, right? And that's when I was thinking, like, this is supposed to be a team, the Devils, that are... I believe third on the face-off dot and uh, doing so well. And, you know, it was kind of boring. Like you said, in the first period, the first five minutes of the game, uh, there was only one shot on net in total. Uh. <laughs> so it was just a bunch of back and forth and not much going on besides, you know, a chance here, but it, there was nowhere near the net or it was another block or I don't know, just not much going <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't believe that there were 60 shots in this game, eh? Because for so no. long, the Leafs were held to under 20, and the fact that they finished with 27 after all that is crazy. It was yeah. really in spurts. It was uh, There was like kind of a flash of it in the second and a flash of it in the third, where it was just absolutely back and forth, crazy chances, crazy saves. Matt Murray kept this yeah. game from being like 4-1. Oh, 100%. Oh my God. Matt Murray tonight, you know, 909 uh, save percentage. But honestly, it did not feel that way. It, to me, he, he played like a 960 in net just simply because of the high danger chances that he saved tonight. And uh, you're right. Like, um, I don't know. It's just sometimes you watch the Leafs play and you're just like, guys, like, you got to protect the goalie. But yeah. good thing he's on his game. I don't know. So the thing that keeps happening these last couple of games is the Leafs will score and then immediately there's a goal. Like, and I got a shout out to Mike Ross who does our intro. Poor guy was reading out Toronto goal scored by number 34, Austin. <laughs> and then like literally <laughs> while he's reading it out, yes, we're broad scores. And I tweeted like, how dare you do Mikey dirty like that and let a goal in while he's reading Matthew's goal out. And he said... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a brat. <laughs> what a brat. Uh, Jesper Brat scores, uh, what is it, 11? No. What is that, 24 seconds later? Yeah, very shortly after. But, I mean, the good thing about the first period was that the Leafs scored first, and especially Finally. on the power play. Right? Like, I'm so glad that they clicked on the power, the first opportunity as well, because there's been so many times. And I guess the rest of the game, I mean, the Leafs had five power play opportunities, but they only scored on one. And thankfully, it was the first one and no other than Austin Matthews. Nice shot right in the slot. I mean, bunting, just feeding him right by the net and taking JD, JT spot on the power play as well, if you notice that. Yeah, so they mentioned on the broadcast, JT either broke or lost his stick or whatever. So he went to the bench and Bunting just came flying from the bench through. Everybody went straight to the front of the net. And uh, yeah, not few, I'd say about 10 seconds later, he managed to get that pass and feed it over to Matthews. So uh, good on Bunting to take the spot there, jump in when he needs to and and reunite with his friends, Mitchie and Austin. Yep, uh, the Devils are not the only ones on 11 uh, game streak. We also have Mitch Marner adding a point on that goal to make it 11 games, and he has the longest active point streak in the NHL right now. So kudos oh, wow. to Marner. Yeah. Oh, boy. And Matthews, 13 goals in 13 games against the Devils for Matthews. So, hey, whoever bet on that one, congratulations tonight. That was an easy bet, but... Yeah, Matthews is always, uh, also the highest scoring or goal scorer at the Scotia Bank Arena for the Leafs in history. I heard that. That is <laughs> such a fun stat. Um, and <clears throat> this is going to go down as longest cold open in history. Welcome to Leafs Late Night, where it's never too late for the Leafs. I'm your host, <laughs> Roscoe, joined by Steph. And it seems uh, Sethi has just joined us as well. Um we are presented by Inside the Rink. And uh, remember to like and follow and leave a rating and all those fun things. And we have a Discord as, um, just real quick, we'll touch on this because yeah. Twitter is uh, a bit in limbo tonight as 
if you did not see, um, because Elon said kind of buckle down or get out, a bunch of people decided to get out and uh, so many that they can't keep track of who's uh, access to take away. So they're closing all the offices until Monday so they can go through whose uh, cards should stay activated and whose shouldn't because they're afraid people are going to come in and trash the office because they've already quit. <laughs> so Twitter's basically a uh, unsupervised child until then, and everyone's figuring it's going to go south. So our Discord has gained, I don't know, 15 members tonight in the uh, wake of this. So if you mm -hmm. want to hop on, the link is in our link tree in our bio. I've also been tweeting it out. You can get it from Steph's Twitter as well. It's all over the place right now. I'm also yeah. going to check out Mastodon on the weekend because everybody's saying that's the new Twitter. I'll give you all a breakdown um, either Saturday night or whenever, um, if I get to it Sunday, the next episode. But I'll let you guys know what it's like and if it's worth hopping over to and if we're going to go there. Cool? Cool. Yeah. Some fresh stuff we have to explore. I mean, the times are changing and I, I'm not even kept, um, I can't even keep up with TikTok, guys. So uh, I know, you know I'm not on bear there. Bear with me. <laughs> but yeah. So are you there? I'm not sure if you've loaded in. No. Okay. No, I see the three dots, but uh, maybe he'll join us soon. We'll see. Uh, so back to the game. The first period ends at one, one. And um, honestly, I didn't, I wasn't thinking like either team was going to take this. It was pretty evenly matched. I mean, obviously, like, uh, what's his name? Hughes said in the interview, we're on a heater, man. I think we're going to do fine. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> what a question. They, they honestly, they played with not the exhaustion of a team that's been given it for 10 games, but like the confidence and swagger of a team that's just won 10 games. So I'm kudos to them for keeping it going because these kids, I mean, obviously they're all, the whole team is like 20 years old. So of course they have the energy to keep doing this. Uh, but yeah, I uh, I think the Leafs stood up to them pretty well. Like we said, the faceoffs were all in the Leafs' favor. Um, shots were in the Devils, but I mean, I think on the whole, the Leafs played a good game. Not too many defensive lapses. I, I mean, fucking Sandine's been killing yeah. me lately with these turnovers. There was the one that uh, I think it was either Stewie or, or Fridge brought up in the uh, intermission where there, he had an easy clear. He could have just passed it along the boards to... Uh, uh, Lilligren, but instead he went out in front of the net and coughed the puck up. And it's like, oh my God. Yeah. In the first period as well, uh, he couldn't handle a hot pass from JT and Sandine's about to enter the zone to accept this pass. But I don't know what happens. It just goes off his stick or off his skate and it creates a two on one going the other way. Thank <sighs> God for Murray, right? Like he had to stand on his head a little for that one, but you know, Keith earlier also said Sandine is low on his confidence at this time. So we need to help him get him back to himself. And like, just for example, that clip he watched over and over again from last game, you know, the hot and ready pizza right in front of Sidney Crosby, where Sidney was like, yo, do you know who I am? Like, this is, <laughs> thank you very much, sir, for the <laughs> ready gift, right? But uh, I don't know. Brutal. I'm glad he went, he's on his right or his left side now, right? Which is his right, right side, not his, <laughs> like proper, his, his correct his proper side. side. Yes, yes. And proper. <laughs> so proper. But uh, I don't know if it's helping so far. Like tonight, Sandine still looked a little shaky to me. And they're like, honestly, I'm noticing him more than Justin Hall. And I hate to say it. I know. I know. Hall's been pretty solid. I mean, yeah. he's been playing like he should when he's on his game. You know, just you don't really notice him which is a good thing because anytime we notice him, it's usually a bad thing. But Sandine has been noticeable for all the wrong reasons. And I just, I, uh, it's tough because he held out, right? Like you, you want to feel bad and, and be like, oh, let's get this guy's confidence back. But his confidence would be there if he had been in training camp and been with the guys from day one and gotten his legs. At, like, I just, I, I find it hard to feel bad for the guy when he held out and got exactly what he was offered in the first place. Yeah, this is exactly why I don't feel bad. And I kind of 
believe that Sandine's a little overrated, in my opinion. I know people love Sandine, but honestly, he needs time. And Lily could have had the same ex- exact excuse coming into the year and look at him thrive right now. So, and yeah. I mean, every, every player is different, okay? They're not all the same, but I don't know. Uh, Justin Hall is clearly looking like the more seasoned defender on the ice and, even with the Jesper Brat goal, I mean, Justin Hall was on the ice, but it wasn't entirely his fault. Like, the Leafs got pinched and Gio lost the puck battle, which goes to Halla back to Brat. Like, I mean, Matthews is on the bench and he hasn't even caught his breath from the last goal. He just, like, looked up and he was kind of like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, I mean, there were guys that, that deserve the blame. And uh, you know what? I'm going to pull up because Kelly Cartel on our Discord here made a point to me to uh, stop ragging on Hall <laughs> and uh, go after some of the guys who were actually responsible for the issues tonight. And I think it was in here um, under this one. Uh, the... Sorry. Sorry. I need to find it again. I should have done this before. It's all um, good. <clears throat> I don't know. We had Jordy Ben a minus one, Hall a minus one, Riley Geo minus one. Tonight, no defender was plus. Uh, but lowest time on ice was actually Lilligren, surprisingly. 1449, yet Sandine 1520. I guess that's for the extra power play time there. Yeah, Riley played 26 and a half because he had six minutes on the power play. But worth noting, Hall and Geo with both uh, two minutes on the uh, penalty kill tonight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, Kelly. I'm trying to find it, but I don't remember where we were chatting. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. Second period, honestly, I don't know. It This game kind of felt like really hard to analyze because it was not not too much happening not a lot of whistles um you had the goal i uh three minutes into the third uh he share goes top cheese no hesitation i mean Ugh, just froze murray um good pressure by the leaf fourth line camp tonight uh just hounding pucks like crazy as he always does uh i thought they cycled really well but I don't know what the Leafs top six. I mean, we had Marner, Matthews. Um, oh, you found it. I found, found it. it. Sorry. It was, we have too many channels on our discord now. Uh, two goals were turnovers of the blue line, Ben at the offensive and JT at the defensive. And the Brock goal was on Gino Malgan. Let him walk in back door. Another mistake. Attention to details. Three mistakes, three goals. Got to give it to him on that one because uh, that's been the story of the last couple nights is the Leafs would have come out with the points. Uh, if it weren't for a couple mistakes, it's not like it's been, you know, beautiful play. It was maybe one goal in the Pittsburgh game that I was like, nobody had a chance on that. It was that shot that came in off of whoever. Um, yeah. But like we said, that Crosby goal didn't need to happen. No. So, you know, it's not that they lost that game, but it's it's been more than 50% of their goals against the last few games have just been from mistakes. And you can outscore them. I get it. And they have been for the most part, but it's just, you got to tighten those things up moving forward. That's all. And Keith said right after the game tonight, we got to stop beating ourselves. And that's exactly, exactly what the Leafs are doing. They're beating themselves to death mentally, you know, like you go back, you got the point, but guys, you had this in the bag. Like the first thing I said on our discord was if Marner, Matthews and Riley screw up this overtime, I'm going to freak the fuck out just because it's such a common theme. Like, I don't know. It, they didn't start. They didn't no. start OT. No, it was JT this time instead of uh, Matthews there. But I know I'm going a little ahead of myself. But, yeah, it's oh, it just makes you feel like, oh, guys. Like, I, yeah. I appreciate keeping Marner and JT together. I appreciate keeping Matthews and Nylander together. I appreciate having that first line on the top power play unit. But what isn't working? Like, what happened? I just don't get it. I mean, to be fair, look, like we said, this team was on a 10-game winning streak. It's not like they lost to a bad team by any means here. 
It was no. just that there was mistakes holding them back. So, yes. I mean, the lines were working well. I liked the, uh, like, David Kampf's line, the fourth one, was fantastic. Yes. The Swedish line was Holmberg, Yarncroke, Malgan, I think. It was, no. no. Yarncroke, um, Holmberg, and Engvall. And uh, Ingvall. Yeah. There's so many Swedes. When I say the Swedish yeah. line, I'm like, this could be so many combinations. And there was one point where all five people on the ice for the Leafs were Swedish. So yes. they had Sandy and Lilligan out there too. And yep. I just, every time, and I know we brought this up on another episode, I really hope they just start all talking to each other in Swedish to confuse the other <laughs> team. Because that would be so funny. And I wish they were mic'd up for that. Like, that's something that I'd love to hear mic'd up. Is you send an entire Swedish line out there. And all of a sudden they start yelling commands to each other in Swedish. And the other team's like, wait, what? Where are they what? going? <laughs> that would be that good. That would be amazing. Yes. Just communicate, guys. Like, I don't care which language, as long as you're talking. Because to me tonight, there were a couple power plays where there were no shots. And that yeah. is unacceptable to me. Like, you have to get the puck to the net, especially when, you know, we're thinking about overtime and having these highly paid players on the ice. Think about our power play unit. Like, holy shit, guys. Like, no shot on net. Unacceptable unacceptable entirely and i feel like a lot of what new jersey was able to do to the leafs tonight is just collapse in front of the net when they were on the power play like it was just you could see nylander hovering around like looking for a shot and he'd be like mm -hmm. uh, i got nothing circling around i mean if your name wasn't angval or sorry if your name wasn't marner matthews Tavares, or willie you probably weren't even getting a shot through like angval couldn't get anywhere near the net Mulligan was trying to shoot from, like, the goal line in the corner. Like, no one could get close to Vitek. I mean, yeah. like, you could tell by the shots through the first two periods. They weren't getting anywhere near him. And it's just, it shows how they've been able to uh, to shut everybody down. And on the communication thing, to the New Jersey side, that was probably something that has been keeping them winning through all these games. Like, they passed so well. Like, they know where everybody is. They... They just, they look like they're communicating well. That's all. Like you can tell from yeah. this, to be able to play at that speed and connect passes and make those kinds of plays, like you got to be talking to each other. And that's something that the Leafs should uh, take note of. You know, you want to play fast, you got to call it out. Definitely. And just speaking of shots there, you know, ending the second period, this uh, shots in the second period, eight to six for the New Jersey Devils. I mean, six shots alone for the Leafs. Come no. on, guys. Like, you guys had a couple power play opportunities. You had six on five a couple of times. I don't know. Like, the, the pressure was great from the fourth line, the third line cycling through. And you're absolutely right about Malgin. I mean, I believe in the first period he had a spinning shot. Like, I, what the, that's the thing I love about this guy. He doesn't hesitate, and he always jumps on the opportunity. So even if it's a bad angle shot, as long as he's getting that puck towards the net, maybe hoping for a rebound or having a guy up front – why not instead of dumping it and no one's there or like no look pass and instead of looking like a genius you look like an idiot if it doesn't yeah. work so. uh the other thing that was very yelled about tonight was the officiating um yeah before we move on from the second because this is when the first of two things that happened two of the exact same thing so jonas siegenthaler interferes with timothy Lilgren. arm goes up and the Leafs send the extra attacker out, and they're playing it out. They got a, a solid, like, minute of it, and it's looking good. But over the course of this, uh, somebody got tripped or hooked. I don't even remember anymore because there were two of them. Which one Marner tripped. On this. Yeah, Marner got tripped on this one, and then it was the hook on the other one. and the high, Or the high stick on the other one. But um, yeah. So Marner gets tripped, and we're like, okay, cool. Even the, the commentators are like, all right, I mean, this could be a five-on-three here. Because that's, that's two... Two penalties. That's two penalties. Two. Two of them. Yeah. And uh, nope. We just get one. Because uh, that wouldn't be fair. Yeah, I don't know how the rules work for that. Like, I don't know if it's just not allowed to happen. Are we allowed to get on the five on three if there's a six nope. on five? Nope. 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 Okay. Nope. You got okay. your time. 
if, you if you're your out time. there on the six on four, then uh, or six on five, then that that, then that negates it. You, it's a uh, <sighs> rule, I guess. I don't, well, I don't what's even more frustrating was that this was one of those power plays that did not register a shot on goal, and you were already frustrated because you know another penalty not called. I know the rule book mm-hmm. is kind of you know, wishy-washy, but there was another time too where I think Matthews was hooked. JT got a stick to the face, Marner a stick to the face. Like Okay, oh to be fair, God. everybody was yelling about the Marner high stick in the first period. I watched the replay of it because I was mad about that too. Uh, that was the puck that hit him in the face. Ah, uh, yes. I saw the replay on that after. It slowly like trickled off the stick and up. It was kind of weird, eh? Yeah. It was like the stick was coming up and it just missed him, but the puck rolled off and hit him in the mm-hmm. face. So, I mean, yeah. it, you could have sold that as a high stick and I think he tried to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, at this point in the league and everything these guys have been through in the last few playoff series... Why not sell that shit? Like, you have to play the game to win the game. And that is a part of the game at this point, in my opinion. Yeah. And then we get to, oh, pardon me, Jordy Ben gets called for cross checking on Jack Hughes, even though um, I'm pretty sure that was a clean hit. Like, Mm -hmm. if Jack Hughes was not bent over so that his head was where his fucking waist is. That would not be anywhere near close to his head. Like, Ben is reaching down on this hit, but Hughes is, like, tiny. He's half Ben's size and bent over. Like, how is Ben supposed to make this hit clean? That's exactly it, Johnny. You nailed it on the head. The guy is short. Ben is a monster. So any angle, he's getting it in the head. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it, it wasn't even, it was like, oh, it was a little close to his head. So we should call this across. Like, it was, it was like here, which is, you know, not close. It's that mm-hmm. he went like, if, if Ben was very clearly like going straight forward, that would be intentional to the head. But he is like, I know I'm big. I'm going down. And Hughes is literally bent over forward. Like there's no way that couldn't get called. That's so stupid. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm I'm just glad, you know, the interference call was called on Bastion against Matt Murray. I mean, don't touch our goalie, bro. So as long as <laughs> I'm just glad they went on the four on four. Of course the Leafs could not connect for that, but damn. I mean, JT in the third period got high sticked in the face. There was no call. For like I mean, the third game in a row. Yes. And immediately after, um, McLeod chips the puck over the over the glass, and it's like, damn, you have to do something like that for the whistle to go. Like he clearly just got whacked in the fucking face, and that's nothing. But okay, let me throw the puck over the glass so you guys notice, and we stop play, and then finally the whistle goes. Like, yeah, come on. again. So that one should have been two penalties. But then what was the one? One of them lost their stick and there was like, or is that, was that the one that where Severson got called on Holmberg for cross-checking in the third, but where he mm-hmm. didn't have a stick and just like shoved him down from behind? Yeah. Like, what the fuck to is start this? The third period. Yeah. yeah. It's, I don't know, man. Like the penalties, uh, <laughs> I don't know how um, things just didn't get called. It's just one of those games there's no answers to it right and you think we have tinfoil hats on but new jersey devils at the third period they were controlling the play and the leafs tried to hem them hem them in their own zone but just nothing was working until our savior nylander oh my god scores i thought this was going down and where we weren't going into ot but thank god for prince nylander so our referees tonight were uh, Ghislaine Hebert and Jake Brank, who I've never heard of Jake before, Brink. but I will now remember these two as the ones that didn't call these five on threes twice in one game. Like you joking. Ugh. Yeah. Even if it's not a rule, if it's a rule thing, we're just mad. Okay. Don't come at us later. Don't. It's not me. a rule thing. It's a thing they can do. If two penalties happen, if another thing happens during a delayed penalty, you can call both of them. Like, that's how you could call four on four because two people got a penalty. It's the same thing. Okay. Uh, okay, let's touch on the fact that 
the person okay there, there's one person that was brought up all through i mean engval was kind of one of them but alex kerfoot has been the uh, the topic of the last couple of weeks because even people like being mentioned last week as a defender uh or last week last episode as a defender of him it's it's been tough lately um i'm just looking at our scratches tonight, we had Mac Hollowell, Nick Robertson, and Wayne Simmons, all healthy scratches. Uh, well, Pierre Engvall and Alex Kerfoot did a whole box load of nothing again tonight. Mm-hmm. So can, do you have a, any any reasoning for this other than like what I said where, the, you know, the GM's not going to let him move Kerfoot down or scratch him because of how much money he makes? Yeah, so... I don't think Kerfoot would ever be sent down just because we have guys in rotation that are used to being sent down. There are already half of a Marley anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. But Nick Robertson, Keith said today that the decision was influenced by a desire to give Pontus Holmberg a run at the NHL level. So this move also gives the ability to place everyone in their natural positions, which is interesting. So if Nick plays, I guess there's a little bit of a mix-up or someone's not playing where they should be. But he did say we don't want Nick sitting out too long. <sighs> Man, I, I had a good hope about Holmberg tonight because the Leafs actually have won the last two games with him in it, 5-2. to two. <laughs> So I'm like... Okay, he must be our good luck charm. But I thought he had a good game. I mean, is it better than Robertson and what he brings to the table? I think they're completely different again, right? Like, we have this high expectation for Robertson. He's supposed to come in on that left wing second line and score a bunch of goals or feed JT and Marner a bunch of goals, Willie a bunch of goals. But I don't know. It's... A consistency thing or okay not, let, let me just read something out for this argument okay um two goals three assists for five points shooting 11 percent uh 100 percent on the face off dot probably only took one um 10 hits five blocks the other one goal and five assists for six points shooting 3.4 percent with four hits and eight blocks. So there's your answer. Yeah. And do you know which is which? Is the first one Holmberg? No, the first one is Nick Robertson. Okay. The second one go. is Alex Kerfoot. Kerfoot. Oh, nice, nice, nice. So just to recap there, Nick Robertson through 10 games has five points. And in those 10 games has 10 hits and 18 shots on goal. He's shooting 11%. Alex Kerfoot through 17 games has six points, one more than Nick Robertson in his 10. And he's shooting 3.4% with less hits on the season than Nick Robertson does through 10 games. Not that I'm saying hits matter for everything, but the fact that he has about the same hits and blocks or more hits and about the same blocks and is perfect on the face-off dot. Like, I can't see anything other than money keeping him out. But what's frustrating to me is one of them has to move, and one of them has to move now because it's creating a problem. Like, it was it was a problem that they've put off for too long, and now it's decision time because, like, Robertson is a healthy scratch, and that's not okay. He's got to be in the AHL playing all season, and you've got to commit to somebody, or you got to move Kerfoot or move Robertson. Like, this is this is insane. I'm tired of this. Yeah, it's frustrating. Honestly, like you can't have I agree, you can't have him sit. He needs to play. I don't care where he plays, he needs to play and like Holmberg, they want to give him a chance at the NHL. You have a couple guys ahead of him. So are those couple guys just not working? Like what's the point there? I I, I mean it is early in the season, but I mean we're at game 17 now. And we keep pulling guys up for one game at a time. Like, oh, let's try Holmberg out. Let's try yeah. Holloway out. Let's try Crawl out. Let's game try 18. Mete. Let's try. Like, they keep bringing. I mean, I know Mete is not a prospect, but like, they keep bringing people up for like a game or two at a time and rotating them. And like, isn't this what the extended for a stupid amount of time preseason was for? Like, why are we mm-hmm. still doing this game seventeen? I I expected this for the first like five or six, but we still do not have a solid lineup at this point, and that's kind of bothering me. 
Yeah. Yeah, it is frustrating. Um, I love our fourth line. I got to give it Me to too. you. Me too. I got to say that. Signed David Kampf I yesterday. I love our fourth line. Yeah. Kampf is super valuable. Malgin, honestly, he's he hasn't been scoring lately, but he is putting out the effort that I see. He will. Yeah, it's just a matter of time because he's trying. He's obviously playing hard. Czar, same thing, right? Like sometimes he's a little, uh, but I thought tonight and last game, oh my God, he was on fire. I think he started to find it the last uh, yes. five games or so. I think it he's took figuring him a little out his bit. role. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Yarn Croak will get there too. He will. Yes. that's And he's not really playing for offense. He's working on his defensive side of game because you would think that our beloved giraffe would use his shot. Mm -hmm. This guy would be great like on that left wing in Holmberg, right? But I don't know. Do you switch out Ingvall for Robertson or put him on the second line? Or yeah, like... And we've tried it though. Like now it's just a blender. I agree with you. Something has to stick. Like you have to build some chemistry here. You have to get them, I don't know, in the groove, all gelled together. I know it's a lot to ask for, but there's got to be some sort of like three for one trade out there because it seems like they just have too many people. Like there's got to be some team that's looking for a couple third and fourth line guys that have somebody that makes a little too much money that they want to get rid of that what they can make this deal work because like honestly it seems like they just need someone that they can put in that slot every night instead of like juggling this cavalcade of people because as much as it's nice to have them when injuries happen like i think they're like we're at 50 contracts this is too many there is such thing as too many yeah and Dubis said pretty much step one of the problem, and he mainly focused on defense, saying that S- Sandine and Lily are going to be given a you know better opportunity this year to rise up to the occasion. Step two is to assess and then hit the trade market after, which I guess is trade deadline time. He did not mention anything about our forward group. He only mentioned our decor and goaltending. So I feel like they they think it's all from within. Like if one guy is not working, on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. But it's pissing people off. <laughs> and it's going to start pissing the players off. Like, I mean, remember free Frank Corrado? You're going to start hearing free Nick Robertson soon if he see- keeps being healthy scratched. Like, why do we have this guy? If there were 15 teams asking for him in trades last year and we were going to sit here and healthy scratch him for the first, like, quarter of the season, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah. And just the fact... I'm not saying they should trade him. I'm saying, like, if if this was what you were going to do with him, if you didn't know, if you had no plan, if it wasn't, no, we're not moving him because we're putting him on the second line this season, like, why didn't you move him then? I I honestly think that they're waiting and assessing to see if they're going to be moving a piece from the defender list and then packaging them out later on and maybe getting a D and a forward back in return, but that's not going to happen for a couple months at least. So like if Sandine continues his play, honestly, I can see him being a piece. Um, I mean, his rookie year, I got the stat from Luke Fox uh, in 28 games. He had 15 giveaways this year in 18 games. He's had 16 giveaways. Oh, yeah, it's not looking too good for him. And obviously it doesn't help his case from his history this year, as we talked about a million times. But man, like I, the potential I honestly... and the dollar value on his contract makes him somebody that teams will still go after regardless of how he's playing right now. I yeah. Think. Yeah. But just to wrap up the game, I guess, Leafs lose in overtime. They are 1-4 yeah. in OT on the season. Uh, and it keeps just, ending within, like, a, th- less uh, than 60 seconds. Like, can you at least get a shot on the other net before the fucking game ends? Like, this is so annoying to watch. It's like it goes in overtime, and I want to just tweet out, like, all right, send me the questions because this is going to be done before I hit send. I honestly had a high hope because, you know, the Devils had control of the puck. They were in our zone. JT, you know, intercepts a pass and it looks like he has control, but everyone's kind of squished in the middle and he tries to lob it to Marner. It's 
bad pass, bad pass, mm-hmm. like through a couple red jerseys, goes the other way. Just, I don't know, just no chance. <laughs> I'm like, guys, like Matthews is not out there, first of all. Um, me, like, I'm glad that they tried JT. And I mean, Callie in our Discord was like, put JT out there. But damn, like, just too slow on the play. And puck goes the other way. And less than 30 seconds in, it's over. Can we talk about, though, before uh, in the third period, Nico Heischer absolutely fucking undressing Mitch Marner on his defensive shift? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mitch. Poor guy. Yeah. So Marner got his uh, his shift on defense that we've all been talking about. And, um, you know, it's like Sandine coughing up the puck to, to Crosby. There's some things that when you're new to this, you just don't want to happen. And one of those is a one-on-one with Nico Heischer, who's on a 10-game winning streak. Uh, <laughs> when it's your, what, second shift on defense outside of power play time. So, uh, yeah, Mitch didn't look good on this one. Oh. No, he did not look good on that one. He did not look good in OT. Broke like, his ankles. Oh man, he he's been good defensively. I don't know what's going on with him. He looked great in the first period as well. He zipped around the ice, had a great shot on goal, went from one end to the next end. Honestly, I enjoy JT and Marner together. I believe oh, they yeah. have the best chemistry. They kind of slow it down a little too, and. Um, you know, just think about the play, whereas Matthews and Nylander kind of rush up the ice and make that, you know, fast play together. So they complement each other. But JT is able to slow it down and, you know, look up for Riley, look up for Marner and bing, bang, boom in the net. Like, whereas the second lines come or the, you know, opposite line is crashing into you. So... Yeah, I feel like JT Marner in overtime might be the way to go next time this happens. Yeah, yeah. But, see, uh, see how it goes. I don't know. Did you see that uh, the New Jersey Devils, we actually talked about it in the beginning of the season. They were doing a fire Lindy chant yeah. because they lost their first two games. Now they're saying, sorry, Lindy <laughs> chant. That is unreal. <laughs> yeah, I think wow. we, we might have talked about that. We did, last yeah. One, last episode, but oh, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's hilarious. I think they're selling T-shirts of that now too. That's amazing. Uh, fun fact, though, as we talked about how good the third and fourth lines played, um, the minuses on the Leafs tonight: Zach Aston, Reese, Kelly Yarncro, Pontus Holmberg, Pierre Engvall, Dennis Malgin, David Kampf. All mm, minus one. All of the people we applauded. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, Justin Hall and uh, Jordy Ben. Both minus one, and uh, Riley and Geo both minus one. Lily and Sandine were the ones that weren't. So uh, nice. this is why the numbers don't match. You know, <laughs> yeah. sometimes you got to watch the game, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah best exactly. on the faceoff dot tonight was David Kampf, by the way. Um, he was 75%. I know he doesn't take Ooh. as many, but uh, Matthews was 56. Holmberg was 50. Uh, JT at 56. You know, David Kampf takes the hard face-offs. He's always in the defensive zone. and Penalty you know, kill. When, yeah, facing the other team's top two lines, like hoping to win that draw and take control possession so that the our top two lines can go the other way. And so valuable. Oh, Mitch Marner had three giveaways tonight. Yeah. Well. So did Sandine. Uh, four takeaways for JT, though, on a positive note, because I like Ooh, nice, nice. having something positive. Okay, so we've got a bunch of questions, and we've got uh, some other stuff to talk about. So what sh- should we do first? We're at 43 minutes here questions. already. Questions? Questions? Okay. Do you want to start with the um, the Discord ones, and sure. I'll pull up the Twitter ones here? So the things that we might have to push here uh, to our next episode... Mm-hmm. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven potential defensive trade targets for the Leafs. So, do you feel like doing that tonight, or do you want to save it? I feel like we should save it to hear what our fellow <clears throat> colleagues have to say. And... Okay, so in that case, shout out to Stats Mundine uh, on our, um, Twitter, who um, I borrowed this from with his permission. So uh, just to give you a 
uh, little teaser for the next episode of, to tune into this. If there's anyone you'd like me to add to the list, um, shoot me a message on, or, you know, tweet me or discord or whatever. Uh, Luke Shen, Dimitri Orlov, Dylan DeMello, Brennan Dillon, uh, Jeremy Lauzon, Scott Mayfield, Dante Fabro, Connor Murphy, Nikita Zadorov, and then from Frege and Stewie, Matt Dumba, and John Klingberg. So a lengthy list that we will break down and see who was uh, who's worth going after. Yeah. Come back for that. Okay. Okay, Discord questions. Yes. I'm just looking up at our Discord, and I just have one question in relation to jerseys. And... Okay, so Cali Cartel sent a bunch of pictures asking, what is the best alternate jersey? We have the Bieber, St. Pat's, Retro from 22-21, Arenas 1.0, 2.0, Stadium Series, White, Classic, Sen- Sentinel <laughs> Classic, like so many different ones. So just a quick opinion, Johnny. What do you uh, like? What, what's my favorite of the alternate jerseys? I like the all white stormtrooper one from the arena classic. I think it was here. Let me pull it up. Cause I think he's got all the pictures there. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, the, I don't like the aretinas one. I don't like any of the St. Pat's ones. Yeah. The 2018 stadium series was cool. Um, I have one of the gray reverse retros. I'd, I'd like it in theory. I don't like the way that they did the logo on it. So which mm-hmm. one do I like the best? Um, it's hard. Uh, honestly, one of the best ones they've done in recent memory is the uh, the Bieber, um, the Drew one, the reverse. Yeah, fair. I and think it's we- like the most unique in terms of having like I I didn't get the blue and or the black and yellow at first, but like mm-hmm. the the way that it's the you know the main not turned out way um, yeah. with the the skyline and the the I don't know it's just unique. With yeah. it being uh, old style. I don't like the barber stripes and I don't like where it's yeah. just like the word. So I don't know. What about you? Um, so it's hard, right? We have the St. Pat's jersey, which is iconic, right? It's the most yeah. it's different from the rest of the blue and whites. We had the twenty twenty two Heritage Classic with the you know, the just the T in the front, which we haven't seen, and the dark, dark blue not even navy but way darker but i think my favorite honestly out of all of these options has to be this year's retro like if we're comparing all of them i mean i I don't like the barber stripes as well i don't like the 2018 stadium series with like mostly white because i remember watching those guys on the ice and i felt blinded it was just (laughs) too much white going on it was kind of cool yeah, I don't like the gray, so I'll go with this year's. But okay, fair enough. Other than that, we had Se- no, I. Mm, That's it. In- oh, we had Lucas. Sorry, sorry, guys. Yeah. There's a lot going on in this Discord, and I'm I know. trying to keep up. <laughs> Our Discord exploded tonight with a lot of people, so please hop on. Um, oh, the other thing is the uh, the Panthers jerseys, the reverse retros with the palm tree and the hockey sticks, sold out. Oh. I wanted one, and the day that they came out, they sold out. So, um, oh, nice. Wow. Waiting on a restock. Wow. Lucas says, Ingval Hall, what do? Ingval has been a non presence. Hall, look, he hasn't got a role. He hasn't got a role, really, hey? Um, I mean, they've, we've got enough defenders injured and Hall's been not awful and it's been Sandine that like, I'm not super concerned about him and what to do with it because like Callie Cartel said in our discord, nobody's going to take him really. And you know, what else are you going to do? He's a right-handed defender for 2 million. I get it. He's not always great and we rag on him a lot, but whatever. Um, Angval is the one that I'm more concerned about just because it's somebody that they've put time into developing and giving him i mean i sound like this could apply to justin hall too they put time into developing him and giving him minutes and everything so i guess it kind of goes both ways for them that they're guys that have been in the organization for a while that you know what are we working towards if 
if this is the ceiling, like, was this really worth all this? Yeah. Y'all know I'm a huge giraffe fan and I really want Ingval to work out. We know his potential. I think he can only get better, but this year has been absolute dog shit besides. He's just got to use his goals. size. Yeah. I, I think it gets better for him, honestly. And Hall, he's not going anywhere. Uh, Hall is going to be a leaf until he retires. <laughs> Mark my words. So we just got to love him and give them positivity. So they don't go into a uh, breakdown mode. Yep. Um, next up from Twitter, we got from Nathan Bondi, one of our writers at uh, Inside the Rank. Why can't we go one overtime without a turnover leading to a goal? I don't know. And these are all the same thing. Leafs Nation mm-hmm. at our Leafs Nation. Yes. Uh, why the fuck are we not starting our top players in overtime? And then Zach Efron Reese, who has the best name. <laughs> um, should Kerfoot okay. be in the top six? He can't score. So this kind of applies to everything we're saying here. Yeah. So thanks for all the questions, everybody. Um, I don't know why overtime. Who started on overtime? It was Marner, JT, and Riley. See, that should... <sighs> yeah, it should have... No, on paper, of course. It's a great starting lineup for your overtime. I mean, O-Dog would argue you should put your 60-goal scorer out there, right? <laughs> but if you want the guys to get the play going, you're, you're taking that risk. But you also have JT, who's also scored 47 goals in his career a couple of years ago, and Marner, who scored over 30 last year. So... Where's the problem? I I get the argument. Like, look, there's four of them, and you can put any combination of them in overtime, and it should be better than what most teams can put out there. So to yeah. say that JT and, and Mitch out there is the wrong choice is it's kind of silly. But, like, and to say it's not our stars out there, like, I get... Matthews and and Mitch, I get when they are out there, they're fast, and right off the drop, if they win that face-off, they can get it in the other end and, and end it quick, like has been happening to the Leafs. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. They got to practice think, three on three at, uh, you know, at practice. <laughs> I think the Leafs' problem is that they're relying on Matthew's shot too much in overtime and relying yeah. for him to finish it all. And I did appreciate him not starting the first shift out there because we obviously didn't want to repeat, but it was just positioning. Uh, the Leafs got caught up in their own feet. I mean, the pass to Marner wasn't successful because he was covered by two other de- devils. Like, there was no chance. So if there was more space created and, like, the ability to maybe bank it off the boards or... I don't know, just time and space in general, it would have worked. But positioning, no, just way out of whack. So, yeah, did not work. Oh, man. Um, I just got to give a shout out to VTech Power Play at Jordan 44 for the stats on um, Kerfoot and Robertson there. And for pointing out how does Nikki Bobby have more hits? And uh, (laughs) he said, complete waste of cap space and a roster spot. Same with Engvall. Trade these two guys, free up the five mil. You wouldn't even notice them gone. You're right, honestly, with the guys waiting, right? Uh, And it's like a different game every time new players are in the lineup. So, Yeah, I think it makes sense that it's going to be some forwards going somewhere for a defenseman. That's just kind of the tea leaves I'm seeing here because they got a log jam one place and a big gaping uh hole on defense yeah honestly and some money to spend for the first time in a long time so i'm interested to see how dubas does with uh five and change because we've only seen how he operates with like you know 15 spots to fill and 18 million dollars to do it so yeah (laughs) yeah i know but uh any more questions that's all from twitter actually Thanks, everyone, for sending in your questions. Uh, Fun fact, tonight, Phil Kessel reaches 1,000 consecutive games. He is already the Iron Man in the NHL, but he has not missed a game since Halloween 2009. And wasn't the game tonight against Arizona? I believe so. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I remember hearing that his game was going to be against the Coyotes, too. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So. Speaking of the Coyotes, I actually have a fun announcement. So um, being part of Inside the Rink, there's other podcasts and 
writers from all over the league. And uh, we just welcomed on an Anaheim podcast called the Late Arrivals podcast. They're Ducks uh, fans, but one of them, Chris, is from Phoenix, Arizona, who is a giant supporter of hockey out in the desert. And uh, noticed that I tweeted today, there was, I think it was uh, the, what's that? Not Ticketmaster. What's the other one that's TickPick or something? TickPick? Tick is that one? I don't know. StubHub? No, it wasn't StubHub. Anyway, one of them was like, you know, relocate a team in your favorite league. And I said the Quebec City Coyotes. And he's like, hey now. <laughs> and so that led to us uh, talking about, you know, we should actually have this discussion on the air. And so the Leafs are going to play at ASU December 29th for the first time. And so we thought it'd be fun to bring Chris on to uh, defend why they should not be playing at the Videotron Center in Quebec City. So uh, mark that one down. That'll be a fun episode. And we're going to start yeah. doing some things like that, bringing on uh, a couple of the locked on hosts as well are part of Inside the Rink. So we can get some of them as well. So um, and also um, maybe a player interview coming up. So stay tuned for lots of cool shit. I cannot wait for their argument. <laughs> like, what is what is the positive to, you know? Austin not... Matthews and Matthew Nyes. I don't know. This Arizona argument. I mean, we've been bashing them all summer long. And now these guys, they have the other side to the story. So that's going to be a good one. Yeah, because I mean, really, it's been management and ownership that has tanked this team. It's not been the fact that nobody in Arizona goes to the games. Like they've had some successful runs, um, you know, moderately successful. I mean, Shane Doan was a star there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's just been the owners that have really tanked the, you know, how this team's been able to manage their assets and, you know, not spend money on players and, or you know, change they, rooms. They got fined. <laughs> well, I'm talking even before when they were fined draft picks and, you know, moving arenas every couple of yeah. years and not paying things. And, the, you know, Arizona Coyotes used to be the Phoenix Coyotes. It's like they're just – they can't find any stability. And I don't think that – it's just unfortunate for what seems to be a pretty big fa- a hockey fan base there. Like people like hockey and like the junior stuff is doing well there and AHL and everything. It's just that they can't – get this fucking team going and that's really on one person Mm -hmm. uh gerald gerald uh betman stein i don't know i tried to come up with a drawn out (laughs) way to say gary betman but it's gary's fault yeah definitely but one person that needs to be recognized actually rick westhead was named Canada's Sports Writer of the Year at the oh, Sports Media Canada Awards. Yeah, Of course he was. Congrats, Rick. Because uh, Rick has just been blown the cover off of everything. He considers himself not like a, um, you know, a hockey writer. He's just like a, a reporter that covers things that happen in sports. A and truther. he's really good at it. Yep. Blowing yep. up everything from, uh, you know, what's going on with the Coyotes to the Kyle Beach story to... Uh, Everything in between, like, really, it's just any big story that's not, you know, a save or a goal that happened last night. You got to yeah. know that Rick Westhead's probably talking about it. All and of the Katie stuff Strang. with content that's, you know, outside of the hockey realm, but related, like the personal lives and the you hockey know, Canada, logistics. all that. Yeah, just amazing. I'm so glad that he got recognized, honestly. Like, how many lives Mm -hmm. has he seriously changed? Not only directly, but, you know, like, just opening the book up to everyone, the viewers, the audience, to hearing the truth and finding the truth for, you know, those affected. So Mm -hmm. thank you, Rick Westhead. Okay, last thing I want to end on here. Um, Alex Edler. This guy's got to watch his knee, man. That is dangerous shit. So yeah. two years ago, if y'all can rewind in your heads, <laughs> Zach Hyman is skating up the boards and Alex Edler stands him up with a knee on knee that was extremely intentional that took Zach Hyman out for two whole months. And Alex Edler got, what, a two-game suspension for that? Yeah. Ooh, fast forward to last night, he does the exact same thing in the exact same spot. Literally, like you could put these 
two videos over each other and they happen like almost in the exact same place. And he does it to Connor McDavid. Yeah. Connor McDavid, uh, who's partnered Leon Dreisaitl on pace for 123 goals, 307 points. You do not and do teammate that. of Zach Hyman. Yes. 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 You do not do that. Like what, what was the response? Did you see the response from the team afterwards after that hit happened? No, I didn't because, uh, just watched the hit. <sighs> you know, guys are dirty. Some players will like even in Tampa versus the Leafs in the playoffs, they knew how to do things to get away with it. And Alex Udler is the type of guy that he's probably done that 5 million times over. And he knows like, Hey, this angle works. And yeah, just dirty, dirty. I saw the interview with Hyman. Oh, they went after him. Yeah. Oh, who's this fighting Udler? I can only see Udler's jersey. But yeah, somebody went after him immediately. Can Who imagine if uh, Evander Kane was there, right? Like he probably would have had a heart attack. Who's number twenty-five on the Oilers? Um, good question. Oilers number twenty-five. <laughs> Sorry. Horrible, horrible. Oh, Darnell Nurse. Duh. Nurse. So Darnell Nurse jumped uh, Edler after. So there was a response to it because okay. uh, that was. As pointed out by um, somebody on, I think it was Twisted Leafs, um, there was a huge response on Twitter to the lack of response from the Leafs when Edler did this mm-hmm. to Hyman. That was a whole thing. Um, and uh, honestly, Hyman was asked about it, and he's like, look, this is dangerous. This guy did the same thing to me. It took me for two months. It's not cool. He was yeah. visibly angry about it. I just, mm-hmm. I can't believe there's no suspension because, you know, I get it. It's on Zach Hyman. Give him two games. This should be five games for doing this to Connor McDavid. This is not only the best player in the league. This is the guy who's bringing the majority of the eyes to this league. Like the league should be doing everything to protect him. Like the NFL does to protect quarterbacks. Like they are the the people that everyone's watching. Don't break them because they make more money for this league than you will ever do in your life. Alex Edler. Okay. Oh, hell yeah. Oh yeah, it's the same thing with the Leafs, like Austin Matthews getting suspended because he apparently, you know, put the stick up in Rasmus Dallin's face mm. and that little, yeah, but then it, the same thing happened to our buds this year and nothing happened in return. I, so I'm, yeah, I'm not going to say that Matthews shouldn't have gotten something for that, but everybody else that does the same thing should. There is a lack of consistency with Peros. He should be fired. Yes. That's the main point of the story. Like I saw a thing today where, um, the athletic, uh, article just ripping him to shreds saying one time he was, uh, up in a box watching a game and the, the whole time he was just reading Twitter. He wasn't even watching the NHL game. He was just reading Twitter the whole time. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Department of Player Safety, and it seems like player safety is never the first thing on their minds. It's just, um, does this person have a history? And what did we do last week? Let's do something similar. Mm -hmm. That's kind of it. Last year? Nah. What did we do last week? Right. Just brutal. It's just fucking annoying. By the way, John Tortorella also reaches 1,400 games tonight. First U.S.-born coach to do so. Wow. Good for Torts. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, thanks, uh, Daily Dose Hockey, if you want to hear another fun stats. Islanders are 9-2 and two in their last 11, but Matt Barzell has 18 assists in 17 games, making him the forward with um, through 17 games in NHL history with the most assists with no goals. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. That's yeah. wild. Uh, I heard another weird stat. You know, the highest scoring player on the Winnipeg Jets is. No, I do not. Give you a hint. It's a defenseman. Morrissey. Yep. Nice. His one goal. He has 14 <laughs> assists. <laughs> Nice. Wow. Hey, the Anaheim, the Anaheim Ducks have not won a single game in regulation. How is 16. that even possible? They have five wins in overtime, none like, in regulation. What that is, the fuck? 
<laughs> that is some absurd, like, you can't, it's, so many things have happened in the first, like, 15 to 20 games of this season that are like, how is this happening right now? We had the Bruins go, uh, go on a 10-game winning streak, didn't they? Or they went, like, 10-1 and one to start the season. Yep, yep. We've got New Jersey now on an 11-game winning streak. We've had 73 goalies play already through 17 games. Are you shitting me? Demko is currently on pace to record a minus 55 goal saved above expected, which would be the worst season in NHL advanced stats history. I need to drop him <laughs> immediately. I can't hold on any longer. All right. I've been benching him. To all fantasy team owners. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Lordy, Man. Lordy. And the Columbus Blue Jackets, it seems every time I, I go on Twitter, another person is hurt on this team. I do not they understand. Tonight, they won 6-4 against I Montreal. don't get how they beat Montreal. Oh. Like, Blue Jackets, daily face-off. I, I remember I picked up Emil Bemstrom, and he immediately got hurt. So, mm -hmm. yeah, he's hurt. So, it doesn't even show who was playing tonight. Uh, let's see. It doesn't even say. Like, because it says somebody who's hurt in their lineup on daily faceoff. Oh. Your left wing lock? Is this a no? I don't know where I could well, find it. Well, Boone Jenner should still be a thing on that team. And you have Gaudreau, Boone Jenner, I believe. Who, who's on the right wing there? Oh, Maybe it says Johnson or Salinger. Bemstrom was a game time decision. I guess he played. We had Salinger, uh, Nyquist, Boone Jenner, Corrali, Oliver. Olivier and Corrali again. So, what? Yeah, I'm just looking at it here. It's um, Gaudreau, Jenner, and Bemstrom were the first line. Chinnikov, Sillinger, and Nyquist. Foodie, Roslovic, Johnson, Robinson, Corrali, and Olivier. And then wow. Gavrikov and Bjork, Christensen and Gabranson, Bayreuther and Peak are their defensemen. And they, they had to drop Peak down to the third pair Peaky. because he's hurt. Peaky. <laughs> Yeah, but he's hurt, so they're burying him on the third line because they literally don't have enough people to take him out. No. And Corrali's playing hurt, too. <laughs> Jake Bean's now hurt. Like, <laughs> what the f They've got Voracek, Line A, Danforth, Blankenberg, Bean, Merzlinkins, Wierenski, and Bogquist all out. Bro, what? Poor Bean. <laughs> Mission oh, Bean. man. Anyway. <laughs> Some crazy shit's going on in this league. That's all I'm trying to say is like, how is it only 17 games into the season? And it seems like we've had a season worth of storylines already. Right? Yeah. I think, yeah, game 18 for the Leafs. And we're almost a quarter way there already. Yeah. It's crazy, wow. though. Like, storyline wise, I mean, look, like I just said about Columbus, there's so much to say about Johnny Gaudreau signing where he did. This. We the Kachuk for Huberto and Uyghur trade has evolved to be quite the the storyline now that neither I mean the Kachuk's been good, but like Uyghur's been I had to drop him in fantasy. He's been like nowhere. Surprising. So surprising. Uh no one saw that coming whatsoever. I mean, they expected Florida to have the off season and Calgary to be on fire, but it seems like just from some Calgary Reddits uh I've I've read and uh Suter is not deploying Huberto properly apparently and is like hmm. getting sixteen minutes a night where he should be getting twenty, twenty two. Twenty three, yeah. Yeah. So he's rolling the lines and not, I don't know. You know, he's very picky and he has I his know. ways, but wh whatever's working, I don't know. Okay. What do they got? Where do they have him? Line combos. You got to be joking. It should be Lindholm to Foley and Huberto. Take a guess at what line Jonathan Huberto is on. Is he on the third? He's on the third line with Michael Backlund and Trevor Lewis. Who's on the first line? Adam Ruzika. Who the fuck is that? With Elias Lindholm and Tyler Toffoli. Second line, Lucic with Kadri and Manjapani. And then you've got Backlund with Huberto and Lewis and Dylan Dubé with Richie and Coleman. What are you doing, Sutter? And he just signed a big 
payday money contract there. He's there for oh eight years, God. right? Uyghurs on the second pair with Zadorov, Tanev's on the third pair, Anderson and Hannafin are the first. Okay, who is Adam Ruzika and why do I why have I literally make his debut today versus Seattle? Enters his third season with the Flames after playing thirty one games in the last two years. Twenty three year old has been productive during his limited time, collecting eleven points and a plus ten in thirty one NHL games. And they put him on the first line. <laughs> Are you shitting me? Why? One too many bathroom breaks for Huberto or <laughs> why? <laughs> Yo, if I'm Brad for living, I'm calling him into my office tomorrow and saying, I'm sorry. How much money did you just put on the third and fourth line between Blake Coleman and Jonathan Huberto? You dickhead. Are you serious? This is not it. what I'm paying for. Yeah, I don't get it. Oh my Lord. Well, fantasy owners are pissed. I've seen a lot of trades happen where, you know, you would think you're getting fleeced, but in obtaining Huberto for literally nothing, but his stats aren't all there and everyone's expecting him to turn it around any moment now, but you can only do so much with your deployment. I don't know. I just, first it was the whole thing that, um, Lindholm couldn't handle Huberto's passes because he shoots the hard, He's the too puck hard. harder. But I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, next game. Saturday. Oh, just because I'm looking at it right now. Um, okay. So guess how much money is being buried on the third and fourth line, or yeah, third and fourth lines of the Calgary Flames. Like 30 something mil. Yeah. So Huberto's 10 and a half. Coleman and Backlund are both five and a half. And then between Dylan Dubé, Brett Ritchie, and Trevor Lewis, you've got another like 12. Oh my God. <laughs> that is <laughs> insane. And we're talking about Keith being stuck, not being able to move Kerfoot down past like the third line sometimes. And this guy <laughs> between the third and fourth line, because Coleman's on the fourth making five mil. Like, this guy's got literally wow. $16 million on the third line between two guys. That's wow. nuts. Wow. So next game. Next game. There's Buffalo. You know, Buffalo is actually, they started the season off hot, but they did not continue. And I do have oh, a Oh, wow. Crazy I've stat. seen that one before. Yeah. So since 2019, 2020... Um, they've combined for 24, 8, and 4, and then go directly on a horrible streak to combine of 6 and 50 after the hot start. <laughs> yeah, so it. this is kind of their thing, is they come out and they're like, we're really good. And then somehow they just suck, and I don't get it. It's like they live or die by however well Jeff Skinner's playing, and um, they can't do that. <laughs> Yeah, Hopefully just... Alex Tuckman brings in and Tage Thompson bring a new little life to that, but fuck. Yeah, but uh, actually eighth in the league in goals four, three point five three goals averaging a game. Um they're not doing too bad. You know, actually no, what the hell am I saying? I am so sorry, guys. They are on a seven game losing streak. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, what are you talking about? They're terrible right now. I've they're that scoring, backwards. but like they're letting in a shit ton of goals. They're like the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yep. They're losing games so. like six three and five four and shit. It's like the um uh, your um Mr. Elite Soup Man in, in <laughs> Edmonton land. Yeah. Where oh, they it doesn't man. matter how many goals they score, he lets in one more. I know. <laughs> or almost. Oh. Well, score prediction. For Buffalo. Um, ah, uh, God, Samsonov's probably going to play because I think he'll be healthy. I um, think next week. I think Murray's think? playing. Okay. Well, if it's Murray, I'm going to say the Leafs win this one. I think it's going to be our higher scoring one. I'm going to say something like five, three or something like that, because you know, it's Olofsson and Thompson and Skinner and they Goldson. just, yeah, like 
Some some nights these none of these guys will score at all, and then some nights like each of them have one or two, and it's crazy. So I think um, mm-hmm. they could pop off easily. And Alex Tuck's been good too. And I think the Leafs are just going to light up a mediocre goalie. So and they don't I have think, a. But well, yeah. there's Dalene and Power though have been a pretty decent defensive pair on offense at least. I think the Leafs will just skate around their defense in their own end though. Yeah. I think the Leafs are going to win 5-2. to two. Okay. And you're right. I think the the top six going to have a very good game. Uh, we're going to see Labushkin for the first time after oh, yeah. getting rid of him. And maybe Craig Anderson in net. The problem will be, like, if the Leafs can't get it out of their own end, that's where they'll die. As long as they can keep it in Buffalo's end, they're going to be garbage there. Like, they're not yeah. a defensive team and they're not a goaltending team. So... It's just going to be a, a game of keep it out of your own end. So, yeah, I think they can handle that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, we got some extra stuff because we didn't get to all of it tonight. On the next episode, we'll have more of the team back. Um, we're going to launch some new things. So stay tuned to our Discord and our Twitter. Thanks, everybody, who joined the Discord. This one's up on YouTube, too. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube, thanks. And give us a subscribe. Appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah. Have a good night. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Leafs Late Night, your night of post-game podcast. Available after every game on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, and more. (laughs) Hey, Marty.